This is the Power Five with Kali Warren Shaw. Welcome, everyone. This is the Power Five, Kali Warren Shaw, the Baseline NBA Podcast, where we give you the top five teams running things in the NBA. It's been a very, very interesting week of NBA basketball. It's been a minute since we've dropped our Power Five, so I'm really glad that we're back up on it. Uh, We wanted to give a little bit of time and opportunity. And given a lot of the stuff that's been happening with references to major injuries, uh, there's been some definite streaks happening, good and bad, for some of our teams. And so it's all culminated to us being able to formulate what we think right now are going to be the top five teams. But alongside of that, some other breaking news taking place in the NBA. And so we culminate, cover it, talk about it. Can't wait to break it down with my right-hand man, 50 Grand, NBA aficionado, www.shawsports.net, Big Kahuna PNC, Warren Shaw, repping down out of Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Holler back at me, Mr. Shaw. Is your tournament bracket busted already? I don't even know. I mean, I did a bracket the the very last minute, like literally an hour before the game started. I don't even remember who I picked, man. So I saw that there were some upsets. I think I went a little big Christmas tree in it a little bit. So I don't even know. I haven't even checked on my bracket. But I hear a lot of people's brackets are busted. How about yours? Oh, listen, man. When all else fails, you Christmas tree that sucker. I, I think I think I came up with a fir a firm uh fern tree. A fern tree style bracket. I'm I'm very sure of it. Um if 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 anything, um, I probably shouldn't have picked Florida Gulf Coast for the upset. So, uh, listen, that, you're, you're listening. I was you're listening listen, to I was, of Christmas past. I, there, I, I, I was <laughs> listen. Somebody was whispering at me. You know what I'm saying? The Gulf Whisperer was talking to me, and you know what? What could I do? How can I ignore the signs? Right. So I went with it. Um, needless, needless to say, though, uh, we've got a great, great show on tap for you guys. Uh, clearly, when we talk about the NBA, uh, no news is 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 without discussion with reference to what has happened to Dwayne Wade. And so that is definitely on the docket. Uh, of course, we're going to be talking about some of the players that have been shut down for the rest of the year. I feel like public enemy right now. We shut it down, shut it down in the NBA. So we're going to be talking about some of the teams that have elected to shut down some of their marquee players and what that's going to mean. And then, of course, we're going to get right into our top five teams that are running things in the NBA. So once again, we appreciate you and yours for tuning into the Power Five. Be sure to check out the show, the Baseline NBA podcast. We do have some great shows already out. We have one with our girl, Alana uh, Tower, who uh, discusses the Miami Heat, our man Paul Garcia, who helps us discuss the Spurs. And then we also did an NCAA edition with our man Christopher client so definitely check out the previous episodes to do that go to at uh at nba baseline and if you want to get at me uh at game face lee my man shaw at shaw sports nba we're available on all the major platforms itunes stitcher radio player fm microsoft tune in and iheart also available on google music but definitely check out 16 wins a ring it's the new premier website that covers the nba great nba content the Baseline NBA podcast features on there, and this is where you'll also catch the Power Five as well. So let's go ahead, Shaw, and get right into things. The big news has been heard around with regards to the Chicago Bulls. Dwayne Wade uh, suffering a severe elbow injury. He has been shut down the end of the season. Ramifications, the Chicago Bulls are one game out of the eighth place seed of the Eastern Conference uh, playoff picture. But I just think more importantly, I, I think it just pretty much kind of right puts the writing on the wall kind of finalizes the painting for the Chicago Bulls season, which has really been an utter disappointment. You're right about that. It sucks for the Chicago Bulls. And you know, they've been, what, three and seven in their last 10 games. And yeah, they still have a chance and they could make the playoffs. But if they get in, what are they really going to do? Um, this team has not lived up to expectation. The only thing I can say positive about it is that, hey, at least Rondo's kind of stuck in there, if you will, if you will. And if nothing else, he might have might have boosted his trade value for the for the off season. Because now he's come back and he's playing relatively well for the team, even though the team itself isn't a very good basketball basketball organization. Uh, Bobby Porter's getting some extra run. Miritich now is going to get some extra run. But I really do wish you know who we need on the case right now. We need Lester Freeman and, and Prez Belusky from the Wire. We need a tap on on Dwayne Wade's phone because I want to know what he's saying or in his house. What is he saying about? This, this stint in Chicago, you know, I want to know what he's talking to Gabby Union about, you know, in terms of, does, does he think he made the wrong decision to come to Chicago? And I would be stunned 
if he was back here next season. Listen, right now, Dwayne Wade's facial expressions reminds me of Marlo Stanfield right now. <laughs> in the, you know, right. in the final season. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I can't believe this is all happening. I can't believe it's all coming down. Maybe I just need to get out the game. Maybe that this is a is an, the thing that I think is really disheartening more than anything is that if you're Dwayne Wade, everything that you were doing, you may have been doing for the right reasons, but everything that you did as far as executing and your reasonings and doing doing it just i don't know if it's it if it's it if it's damaged more so his his legacy and 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 i'm not saying that in the sense that it takes away anything that what he's accomplished on a basketball level but what i'm saying is is that it kind of sheds light at times about you know how players are perceived when situations don't go the way that they that they do do they really control their own fate and their own destiny and it if nothing else Shaw, it, it puts it sheds a real big disparity about you know what Dwayne Wade had to do to get to this point in his career and his best buddy LeBron James and what he's done at this point in his career like you look at it man and you can clearly tell who who holds his own who still, you know, holds the reins when it comes to the NBA and that same dude that still feels like he's been in that uphill battle when he came out of Marquette. Yeah, it, it, w It's funny with me with Wade simply because we've said this earlier in, in, in the year. Well, it was, oh, you didn't leave because of the money per se. You were just, you, you felt you, were, you weren't treated correctly. And you know, now you come to an organization where, in essence, you're not even acting correctly. Um, the way he's he's handled the situation with Fred Hoiberg and the organization itself, and being a veteran guy who's going to be a Hall of Famer and all those things, I think there's certain latitudes that he does have and that he is allowed. Um, but I think you're right; he's kind of painted himself, you know, not necessarily villainous, but definitely a little bit, uh, you know, almost like like he like he's crying a little bit and whining a little bit. I think how he perceived it to be and how he how he wanted that situation when he and Jimmy Butler both went off in Hoiberg in the year. He was trying to be a vocal leader, um, but that really went left for him. And then again, he's played all right this year. I mean, 19 points a game or 18.6 to be exact. Played all. Well, let me, look, Shaw, let me jump in on this real quick because, you know, everyone's going to look at his statistics and they're going to say, you know, his point totals are worse since his rookie season. His assist totals is worst, you know, in his, in his career. I mean, what were you expecting? Right, I mean, seriously. Right. So, Not even just the fact that he's thirty-five, but what were you expecting if Jimmy Butler was supposed to be the guy? And and Dwayne Wade said as much. This is Jimmy Butler's team. We've seen Dwayne Wade do this before, where he's quote unquote sacrificed for the for the good of the basketball team. Remember, he kind of did that with LeBron James until he realized that LeBron James wasn't ready. And then in the second half of the season, while they were so busy trying to facilitate and, and appease LeBron James. Dwayne Wade had to go back to being the Flash. And even though they fell short in 2011, all signs were showing that it was going to have to be how Dwayne Wade channels himself, not just on the basketball court, but off the basketball court, to force LeBron James to take his game to that next level. And that's when we've now seen the monster that is LeBron James. It's been facilitated. I mean, listen, it's been facilitated Dwayne Wade. Dwayne Wade can take credit for that. He could take credit for opening up LeBron James and unleashing the king upon the world. It's like King Arthur finally coming to Camelot and claiming his throne. That's what he and and uh I forget how we how we consider um uh Dwayne Wade in 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 a sense. In, in, those, in those type of medieval comparisons. But that to me is what I think was supposed to happen with Dwayne Wade coming to Chicago with Jimmy Butler. The problem is, is that that really has never been Dwayne Wade. You know, and Dwayne Wade is not tight like that with, Jim but with Jimmy Butler like he is with LeBron James. So that's the reason why that was never going to work. So I think in part, it's part of Dwayne Wade doing what he thought was necessary to do the same way he did in Miami. But I think it's also part in the sense that, you know, he's kind of kicking back and he says, I know this is not my team. I just want to come in here, score the points. I think on talent alone, we'll probably get in the playoffs. And I at least can show that I'm a guy that still got it and still deserves the money I got paid. Yeah, well, I, he really did want to be, um, you know, kind of like you said, kind of an usher for Jimmy Butler to take that next level and that next step. But there just wasn't enough around this team. And, you know, I said with three veteran guys that they could maybe sneak and force a way into the playoffs and then see what happens after that. Um, but the shooting really just has been an issue. The coaching has been an issue. The organization itself has been an issue. 
Um, and like I said, I'd really be stunned to see what happens next year. So I, I no, will, shout out I, to Fred Belusky and Freeman, man. We need to get that get that wiretap up. <laughs> we need, uh, especially, especially, especially when they drop the f bombs. You 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 remember you remember when uh, when uh, when Bunk uh, it started dropping the f bombs when they started piecing together the murder. That that's what that, I'm sure oh, that's yeah, exactly yeah. what's going to be happening. You know what I'm saying with with Dwayne Wade? <laughs> He's like, he, yeah. Every, he healthy, every time right? he looks at his stat sheet for the 2017 season, he'll be like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Well, again, this whole Chicago Bulls season is is the, is the Weebe meme, right? <laughs> you know that goes out there. <laughs> that that, that Weebe <laughs> look like, oh, oh man, uh, <laughs> yo. Uh, so you know, shout out to to Weebay, shout out to all the producers of the Wire, man. Yeah, we were having a wi- we we're having a Wire <laughs> moment for all of our listeners. If you have never checked out the Wire, that is a must see classic series. I know people are on Game of Thrones, on The Walking Dead, but you are you have not officially lived in in civility until you have watched the Wire. Watch the Wire, okay? Uh, Callie Warren Shaw. Of the baseline NBA podcast, this is our seg- our show, the Power Five, where we discuss the top five teams in the in the NBA. Um, so, with that being said, Shaw, we understand that this is a foregone conclusion. Chicago Bulls are pretty much out of the picture. So, you would think that with that taking place now, this really should be a good time for Hoiberg <laughs> to figure out a way to probably play these young players and and really kind of see what he has. But, you know, listen, much more can be said about Hoiberg, man, you know, that he possibly could be put on the hot seat because this now is a reflection of Hoiberg and his ability to handle marquee talent. And while Jimmy Butler was never considered that marquee marquee talent, he elevated himself to that level. Then you add a Dwayne Wade. Then you add a Rajon Rondo, right? And it's just like, is this really going to work with him as the as the head coach? Well, uh, you know, this is we're talking about the Chicago Bulls, right? So let's go to the other side or whatever. Talk a little White Sox here. Was that Bud Harrelson? He gone. Hoiberg <laughs> is not going to be back. I cannot imagine that he's going to be with this organization. Next year, no matter what happens, wait. Leaving, Wouldn't it be wait, great if he just walked away? He's like, listen, I just want to, I want to go ahead he and might. turn in my well, resignation. It might, you know, it might be one of those situations where I, you know, I'm he, sure, I'm sure he he's looking at Iowa State, State saying, "Damn, I could have got my Iowa State Cyclones into like three more, you know, Sweet Sixteen Final Fours." Like, why did I come to take this job in Chicago? But like you said, it, it might be one of like those air quotes where he 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 resigned, where they're business like, listen, you know, you Trump can say quote, face. Trump, you know quote, I mean? Trump quotations. I understand. <laughs> so it's tough. But I mean, the one thing I did read earlier in the earlier in the week is that this roster really has been in a a tough position because they're trying to play the young guys whilst I mean, and still trying to make the playoffs, and that never never really works out. So you know, you guys got now you're trying to get Garen Grant out there, you're trying to get Felicio Felicio out there and get him some burn as well. Miritich was out of the rotation. Now he's back in the rotation. So, like, it's it's weird. Valentine is now trying to get a little bit more burn. Um, but the thing I don't understand is why did you trade for Cameron Payne and you're playing him, like, you know, 11 minutes a night or whatever. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I'm, I'm, I'm baffled. You know, I, I, I don't get it. So, you know, this organization has a lot to work on over the next coming summer. Definitely. All right, Sean, let's go ahead and switch gears and get into the other uh, stuff that's happening right now. So it's Shut it down, you know, public enemy style. Teams are shutting down marquee players. Uh, one of the bigger names, Eric Bledsoe from the Phoenix Suns, he's been shut down for the rest of the season. Uh, I mean, look, we understood what was happening. You know, the Phoenix Suns clearly are are no longer, you know, in in you know, even playing to you know preserve a an adequate season by their standards. I mean, this is going to be another disappointing season for the Phoenix Suns. I, I you know. I don't know what to make of this scenario situation. I, I felt like there should have been a firing sale going on. And listen, they weren't afraid to do that when they were in the midst of playing in the in the play, in the playoff picture in the Western Conference a couple of years ago. So now all of a sudden you shut down Eric Bledsoe. Uh, you know, they they basically are barely playing Tyson Chandler. Look, what exactly are the Phoenix Suns doing, bro? Well, yeah, they're just trying to evaluate talent at this point. They they knew they weren't going anywhere. They've actually played they played decently a little bit past after the all-star break, if you will. And then they've been all right. But at this point, Bledsoe has, I think it's a knee bruise or a bone bruise on his knee rather. And they're just like, you know what? We're not, we're not doing anything. So let's continue to see what we have. So that's why Tyson Chandler has been out of the rotation. They want to see if Alex Len, um, they're going to be, cause they're going to be trying to decide whether or not they're going to give him an extension pretty soon. 
and whether and if that's not the case, then they need to know exactly what they have in him. Um, uh, the young guy, Alan Alex Williams. Alex Lynn needs to go. He just needs yeah. he, he needs to go, yeah, bro. He, he needs to, to go. He has lived up to any type of potential whatsoever, and that's why Alan Williams has come in here and like stolen the spotlight. And again, he's an undersized center. They they can't get away with that for the foreseeable future. You can't have be a six eight guy running around at, at at the center position on a regular basis playing 30, 35 minutes a night. But he has played very very well. So kudos, Alan Williams, at what he's been able to do. Bender's been hurt, so they haven't really been able to evaluate him. Marquise Chris is out there getting a little bit burned. Tyler Ulis um, has really taken up taken up uh, the role um, left by Bledsoe and kind of coming in and being that third guard. And you got to you got to know Brendan Knight's feeling real salty. He's like, listen, you guys are now playing three guards. I've been here all season. <laughs> you didn't want to give me no burn. So Brandon Knight's going to be gone at some point this year. At this point, it's just evaluating what they have. T.J. Warren's going to get some more burn um, and, and some more touches out there. Another he, guard. Just, yeah, well, I mean, he's, you know, he's guard a small forward. forward. Yeah, guard yeah, forward. He's yeah, he's you know, on the wing. Um, but that's just all it is right now. They're just trying to evaluate the pieces they have. Derek Jones, you know, after that dud of a, of a, of a dunk contest, he's running around out there a little bit now, too. So um, the Suns just want to see what they have. And I, I, I get it, because what else are you going to do at this point? Third worst team in the NBA right now as we're recording this show. Um, let's go ahead and talk about the second worst team, the Los Angeles Lakers. And, you know, you brought up a really interesting point, Shaw. First, you know, let's go through the the names. I mean, Luau Dang, Timothy Mozgov, those guys pretty much are done for the rest of the season. I, listen, I'll be honest with you. I barely mentioned – I think we barely mentioned Luau. Luau Dang played this season? I don't even recall. It Was Luau Dang actually on the basketball court this season? I cannot tell, bro. I mean, seriously, that's how quiet Luau Deng has been this year. And he got paid by the Los Angeles Lakers, right? Probably one of the one of the final stamp of approvals for Mick, uh, for Cupcheck's legacy as the GM post the Phil Jackson era, right? Okay, and then Timothy Mozgov, right? Like, you know, I think it was smart of them given the money that they threw away at him and stuff like that. You know, there's no sense in playing this dude if, if this team is pretty much going to cap out maybe 23, 24 wins this year. I think the most interesting thing, though, Shaw, is D'Angelo Russell is not in the starting lineup. And so that is raising some serious red flags. I feel like Washington needs to put a committee together to really start bearing down and asking the questions. Might have to subpoena Jeannie Buss and Magic Johnson, like seriously, though, and Luke Walton, like what's going on? What are we doing here with these quote unquote supposed to be phenoms for the Los Angeles Lakers? Right. And, you know, we, we had a brief discussion off air, and I think to some degree they are testing Russell's medal again. They want to see does he have the mental capacity, um, you know, to, to take this hit right now towards the end of the season while other young guys are playing. Hit? playing More like slap. Like hit slap. No, there's no doubt. I, I you know, I, we are going from, you know, Oliver Maroney coming on the, on the podcast to begin the year, talking about this guy potentially being a, a most improved candidate, maybe even averaging 20 and 10. It even fooled me to say, it's like, all right, well, I can see him maybe getting most improved. I don't know about 2010. But I was like, yo, he looks really good in the preseason. He's battled some injuries and all that. But now at the end of the season where you know you're just still tanking, he's not in a position where he's going to, quote, unquote, win them games and, you feel, and, and hurt their potential lottery position. You need to let that guy burn. So it seems to me that there might be something else going on there where they're trying to test him some. And then I, we might really see his name um, coming up in trade rumors this summer. I would not be stunned if D'Angelo Russell – at least gets discussed like in something for like Paul George or whoever the Lakers may be targeting. Well, listen, I don't want to be a conspiracy theorist every now and again, though. You know, I got to throw it out there. I really feel like Magic Johnson feels some kind of way about DeAndre Russell. I think that he looks at, at, at him and he, listen, if there's anyone that's going to be hard on, on, on the backcourt plate as his representation of the Los Angeles Lakers, it's going to be a guy like Magic Johnson. You know, he's played with guys like Byron Scott, you know, he's played with some some marquee players, right? Um, you know, he's been around during the Derek Fisher years. And those are guys that didn't score a lot of points for the Lakers, but they were floor generals. And I think he really questions whether or not D'Angelo Russell has the maturity to be a floor general for the the vision that Magic Johnson has for this Los Angeles Lakers basketball team. Now, what's interesting is how does that couple with having a guy like Luke Walton as the head coach? Because when I look at Luke Walton, you know, he's handled the temperament of high end profile players like the Golden State Warriors. So I find it kind of interesting that his demeanor and his style of coaching doesn't acquiesce to the style of play that D'Angelo Russell has been looking for since he's been drafted and coming into the NBA. So I think that this is coming from a higher up. And look, if I'm Luke Walton, this is my first head coaching, official head coaching job. 
I'm getting I'm getting paid by the buses in, in, in Magic Johnson. I gotta heed what they're saying. But again, I feel like it's coming down from a higher angle upside D'Angelo Russell's head that he is not the guy to lead this Lakers franchise in the future. Yeah, well, that very well could be true because Russell has nothing but positive things to say about Walton. He said it's night and day, obviously, from Byron Scott. And, you know, this is the first time he's had a real relationship with an NBA coach. And, and he's been excited about it. He said nothing but great things about Luke. So I agree. It has to be coming from somewhere else. Um, I don't know how Luke has delivered the message to Russell. And to be honest with you, I haven't listened to their post games and, you know, check the videos and all those things. And maybe there are some answers that there to be had. Um, but right now, from the outside looking, it just seems very strange. But, you know, the other thing is that they're going to get a look at Jordan Clarkson again at the point guard position. He played very well at the point guard last year. So, you know, he can do it as a scoring guard um, and he can create for others as well, too. So I don't know if that's the direction that they really want to go in the future. Um, but it is a deep draft, especially in the point guard position. So we'll see what happens. But the other thing that they're doing is getting a hard look at Zubak at the center position. Um, played very well in spurts this year. Um, I think he does, definitely has a future, man. So the Lakers team, again, same thing that the Phoenix is doing, just trying to evaluate. Where is the Mamba? Calling the Mamba. I, listen, if there's anyone that's really going to like tear somebody down to try to build them back up, I think it would probably be Kobe Bryant. If and I'm, if I'm Luke, Walken, no, Luke Walton, no, not knowing that I've played next to the Mamba, right, and survived and still managed to be on that, that Lakers basketball team with the Mamba. If there's a way that you really want to tell if this dude is about it, about it, then you need to have the Black Mamba sit down and have a serious conversation with D'Angelo Russell. And I think right then and there we'll tell you whether or not moving forward. And listen, it's not like the Black Mamba doesn't, you know, doesn't uh, have his, op- his phone line open for Magic Johnson and Jeannie Buss. Right? Well, that's true, but Walton had said something about that earlier in the year. Oh, yeah, he did. Um, he did. He's I, like, I don't know if I want to be doing that. And it's probably right. because he understood that the Lakers organization is on shaky ground. Now that the now that we cle- we see past the you know see past the forest and the trees where this might be going. Yeah, I'm just saying, just be on the lookout. TMZ Sports is going is going to be out there in California, heavy. Well, find I think a, D'Angelo find, Russell needs to, to look behind him. You know, he needs yeah, to keep exactly. an eye open because, <laughs> exactly. you know, these, these trade wins look like they're going to be, you know, swooping in on him really, really soon come this summer. Man. Uh, definitely. All right, Shaw. So let's go ahead and get right into it. Time to discuss our Power 5. Now, before we get into our Power 5, we wanted to bring this up because once we start digging into these top five teams, I know what it's going to sound like. Why aren't the Utah Jazz and the Boston Celtics not? In our power five. So, Shaw, I'm going to let you start this off. I- I'm going to let you go in on why you believe that the Utah Jazz and the Boston Celtics have not quite yet earned the right to be in our in our power five. What What are your reasons? Well, I- I'm very impressed with Utah, but they just, I don't know, they, they're still seeing still young pups to me. They have a long way to go um, to, to, to really be consistent. And I, I commend them for the way that they played this year. Um, and you know they're they're definitely a top ten team in the NBA. That's fine, but I just don't think they're one of the top five elite teams going on right now. And with Boston, I just see too many holes in this roster um, that that give me pause and concern. And I've said it before, and I'll continue to say it. I think the Wizards are a better basketball team than them. I don't care what the records are. I don't care what Boston is in the standings. I think Washington is a better team. Um, and the Celtics, although I wouldn't say it's not smoke and mirrors, and they just play too many close games and, and lose to too many bad teams um, for me to really feel confident in their ability to be an elite team right now in the top five. Again, are they a top 10 team? Hands down, no question about it. Um, but I'm very concerned about what them in the playoffs are. You cannot tell me when the playoffs start that whatever seed is playing them, whether that's the seven seed, the six seed, whoever it is, they're not going to, you can't tell me they're not going to feel confident. <laughs> whoever that team is, they're going to feel like, oh, we can get Boston. You know what I mean? We, we can beat them. And that to me, you know, that, that to me is very concerning. What yeah. about you? Well, look, the Boston Celtics, if we're if we're if we're judging this as being a team that should be considered a top five team in the NBA as we speak, their record would speak for that. The problem is, is that that's what's always happens with this Boston Celtics scheme team. Last year, you saw me. I was like Donald. I was like Donald Trump campaigning that the Boston Celtics should have been considered as one of the elite teams in the Eastern Conference, not in the NBA. I don't know where people were getting this perception when I made that announcement or that proclamation. I was trying to say that they're an elite team in the NBA. I was just saying in the Eastern Conference because there's really only three, four teams that you could say would be elite in the Eastern Conference, but elite could be, 
you know, defined in many different ways. With that being said, we're talking about the top five teams in the NBA. And I can make an argument that the Utah Jazz are actually a better team than the Boston Celtics right now, even though there's a difference you know, there's really, they're about the same wins as we're recording recording this show. With that being said, they do not depict as being the best team next to the Golden, uh, the Cleveland Cavaliers, even in the Eastern Conference. Because you can make the argument that the Washington Wizards, the Toronto Raptors, maybe even the Atlanta Hawks could actually be better than the Boston Celtics. It's just that their record is not depicting of it. Now, with that being said, it's very hard for me not to put them up there in consideration. But to your point, Shaw, when you look at this basketball team, if not the play for Isaiah Thomas, can you honestly tell me that this basketball team would really have 43 wins at this particular point? I would be hard-pressed to tell you yes. If nothing else, this pro- this probably would be a team, I would say give or take five wins, six wins less than that right now, which would then put them around 37 and and, and 33 or, or 37, yeah, 37 and 32. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, that's where the swing is. And when I look at what the Washington Wizards have done, yes, they've kind of you know, ran into like a little bump in the road. They, they're they like, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago, they're still a solid basketball team that by when you look at that roster, they're still one of the, they're still one of the better teams. There was a reason why we put them in our top five back around the all-star break and nothing has changed that uh, forthwith. So with that being said, I get it. You guys are more than welcome to land basis. We want to hear where you where, where you come from on this. So get at us at NBA Baseline. Do you think the Boston Celtics or the Utah Jazz are deserving to be in the top five as one of the top five teams in the NBA? I can definitely say that the Boston Celtics are a top two team in the Eastern Conference. But with that being said, that's also making the argument that there are at least three or four other teams in the Western Conference that could leapfrog the Boston Celtics as being a top five team in the NBA. So now that we got that out the way, let's get right into it. Time now for us to break down the Power Five. Number five. In at number five, Shaw, we have the Washington Wizards. And listen, exactly what we're saying. While this has been one of the better teams um, since all, not even All Star, maybe what two, three weeks before the All Star break, this has been one of the better teams in the NBA. They still are not better than the four teams that we're going to get into. Seven and three over their last 10 games. Still impressive play. The combination of Wall and Beal, dynamic, one of the better duos that you can obviously make the argument for in the NBA. This is why where they are. This is why they are where they are right now. Yeah, I'm for Washington, it's been very interesting for me to, to watch their their ascension this year. We all know where they've come from. That story's been told. But what they did recently on a West Coast trip, you know, they came back and you can argue, well, they shouldn't have been down to teams like Sacramento and Portland anyway, especially down 15, 20 points. But they came back in those games. And you know, to have, have an East Coast team, for whatever reason, it's harder for East team to go off the West, especially this late in the season. Um, and they went out there and really did a lot of damage. And they showed me a lot you know, with, within, within their roster. Marquis Morris did a big shot to win the game. Did he step out of, uh, set up out of bounds? Yeah, he did, no doubt. <laughs> but the refs didn't catch it. So he still, you know, had the moxie to knock down the shot. Uh, Bradley Beal, John Wall, we all know what, they, what they've been able to do. Brennan Jennings has been decent, but not really been impactful. But Bogdanovich has been immense for them since coming over in that trade and around the deadline. And again, this is just a team that I think has it all. They can, they can defend. They play at a great pace offensively. Um, you know, they have guys who can knock down shots. Got a great penetrator in John Wall. Um, just a very good basket. Number four. All right, now the number four team that we have slated. Wow, it's really tough for we're saying this, but hey, the real is the real. Golden State Warriors are the number four team now in our Power Five. And listen, Shaw, I understand, you know, the reason why people think that we're going to say that is because of the loss of Kevin Durant. It's not just the loss of Kevin Durant. It's that this basketball team is di- so dynamically different because of the loss to Kevin Durant. They are not the same Golden State Warriors basketball team. And where you think like, oh, they're still got it all with Draymond Green and Steph Curry and Klay Thompson. This team has t- is taking quite some time for them to start figuring out how to get on without Kevin Durant. Five and five over their last 10 games. Clearly not the same team defensively. Some really bad losses, uh, and they have not figured out how to beat the San Antonio Spurs. I mean, look, they need to figure this thing out. 
I, I would like to think that Steve Kerr can can get them back together on this, and it's and, and just hopefully they will get Kevin Durant. But man. This team does not look like the same Warriors team over the last couple of seasons without having that core depth in their lineup. They've definitely struggled, and, and that's unfortunate for them because you feel like, okay, they could at least lock in and understand that defensively is where they really need to pick up. And yeah, they lose Durant 25 points and is whatever it is, five, five, six assists a game and seven, eight rebounds and well, two blocks, all of that. But there has to be ways that you can kind of go back to what you were doing, some of the things, some of the sets that worked for you both offensively and defensively from a year ago. Not having Bogan, not having Harrison Barnes, that does impact things this Steph year. Steph Curry is shooting that. atrocious on the road. Atrocious. Yeah, he, hasn't, he hasn't been that duty, and that's the thing. I think everybody expected, and me included to, to a very large degree, for them to be able to kind of flip the switch back to, to 2016, you know, last year, and just be, okay, well, we're the 73 win Warriors again, and then they'll be fine. And it just hasn't been that easy for them. They're still obviously one of the best teams in the NBA, you know, even the, the best team record-wise. Spurs are right out nipping at their heels, if you will. Um, but they, they've struggled. And that has been a little bit shocking for me to see, especially when, you know, you have to really get uh, a supreme effort from Draymond Green to help you salvage a game against the Pozos and 76 in your home building without Joel Embiid. Um, that, to me, says, you know, you're not trying. You're not doing the things that you need to do. Um, but hopefully they get things turned around. And listen, but hey, the- Durant, Durant's without that knee brace. So, you know, help may be on the way. Well, well, help. Yeah. And listen, that's not help. That's their savior. Look, look, bar none. And listen, we can call it exactly for what it is. This team is suffering. Their depth, their bench is really suspect. Outside of Ian Clark and Andre Iguodala and JaVale McGinn. Listen, I keep saying, I don't even understand why why Steve Kerr keeps doing this where he's playing Zaza Pachulia. I think, you know, no disrespect to Zaza Pachulia, but Zaza Pachulia is not... He's not. He is not working as their starting five. They should stick with McGee and have Zaza coming off the bench. But as far as I'm concerned, that bench is suspect. They are not getting anything from McCall. They're not getting anything from McAdoo. They've got nothing from Looney. They're going to need to figure out something. Harris, uh, uh, Matt Barnes has come in, but sparingly. I think he still is trying to find his way. And I don't know how Steve Kerr is going to kind of figure out in, in the ways that he really should be using him. I feel. I feel like, you know, he should be. He should definitely be getting more minutes over Iguodala. But the dependency now on Iguodala because he's familiar with the system and where the Spurs are catching up. Uh, catching up on them as far as wins go to be the best team overall not just in the NBA but in the West, in the Western Conference it, and clearly you can see the disparity 27 and 4 at home 26 and 10 on the road if you're the Golden State Warriors you have to take this number one seed because now all all roads lead to Golden State to get to the finals and that that to me is going to be tantamount so if Durant comes back, the savior comes back to help him. But a lot can be said about what's not happening for this Warriors team and their bench moving forward. Number three. All right, the number three team, Shaw, the Houston Rockets. Look, they're still doing it. They're, they're Listen, they're kind of clicking on the heels uh, of the Spurs and the, and the Golden State Warriors. But let it not be said, MVP-like season, James Harden, and just getting bang-up job contributions from guys like Anderson, Gordon, Patrick Beverly. Clint Capella is back from his injury. Uh, Nene has even been contributing in spot minutes for them. They're just really showing the kind of play and savvy that's keeping them as a top three seed, uh, seeded team, not only in the Western Conference, but in the NBA. Well, the you know what? I, I I like this team. You know, I, I like this team and what they've been able to do um, all season long. They have been shocking, to some degree. But when you have an MVP candidate on, on your roster, especially having the season that he's having in the beard, well, hey, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is these are the types of uh, numbers that we're going to see. A guy who was third in the league in scoring, first in assists, or some some crazy. Um, uh, they had a signature win against the Cleveland Cavaliers too. I think it was on a Sunday night on ESPN. Um, everything they've done really has worked out for the most part. And they understand and embrace who they are. They are an offensive team that guns and chucks streets. And the fact that you hear all these stories about Antonio being upset when guys shooting mid-range jumpers. You know, I think there was a great story about Lou Williams. He actually shook a guy and, you know, the guy fell down and, you know, he, you know, had him, he ended up taking the mid-range because that's what happened. He's like, well, you should, have shot, you should have shot a three. Well, he was like, well, I shook the guy. You know how it is in NBA basketball. If you shake somebody, you have to shoot it right where you are and you have to make that shot. 
But this is the mentality that this team has. It, it, it's insane. It's insane. And like I said earlier on, when they got Williams, they are just trying to kill everybody. Kill it with fire. More threes and more threes and more threes. That's all they're going to do. Um, and James Harden has been a beast. And I love underrated what a guy who's had a great season for them has been Clint Capella. I love what he's done for them. Yeah, man. Look, the, the, the Houston Rockets and their propensity to shoot the three ball is like the Golden State Warriors in the age of Ultron. That, that's just the best way for me to describe it. This is just like, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's, uh, soon we're going to see uh, H- H- James Harden, you know, with the the, the, the vision uh, uniform, uh, cape and all, and with the infinity, infinity stone sitting dead, sitting dead in the center of his beard. All right. Number two. All right. The number two team in the, uh, in our power five, Shaw, we have the Cleveland Cavaliers. Now, despite... Despite what happened to Andrew Bogan, I feel bad for Andrew Bogan. So please don't don't take for what I just did as a laugh. It's just it's just it, it's absolutely nuts. Uh, while there was speculation that the Cleveland Cavaliers were trolling Andrew Bogan at the at the expense of the Golden State Warriors, um, then they find a way to sign Larry Sanders, I believe, to put him on this basketball team. If that hasn't already happened, I mean, look, this basketball team has got LeBron James and they've got Kyrie Irving. And oh, by the way, Kevin Love is ex- has has returned. So. This team now is going to start to click on all cylinders. We're going to restore the faith and stop, you know, talking all this nonsense about how the Cleveland Cavaliers have certainly fallen off. And if they're not fully healthy, they're not going to rake the run. Tyron Lou now can rest and easy, and he can basically say, we're ready to go. Right. This team is right where they need to be. Um, unfortunate for Bo getting no doubt. <laughs> you know, they had to sign him and cut him. Um, you know, Omri Cassidy style, if you will. But now they got Larry Sanders, who's not going to really do much with them. He's kind of the emergency break break glass type of type of center for them. Um, Bogut was going to help. He'll be he'll be the Mozgov in in the finals yeah. for them. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, maybe he comes in spot minutes in, in, in a in a tough situation and, and does something, but I'm not really looking for. Would it be funny too if he wins if he wins the championship and he says, "Okay, I'm going to retire." <laughs> Oh shit! <laughs> well, I, even would, got, I even got that one out of you. <laughs> uh, that would that would definitely be something, um, you know. But again, I think kudos to him if he were able to get a ring and then dip out. But yeah, this team is they they seem to be kind of getting back on track a little bit. Again, I was getting Kevin Love back is huge. Getting Jr. Smith back from a week ago that's huge too. Um, you know, there's nothing to worry about. Like I said, nothing to see here. Just the Cavs being the Cavs. LeBron, you know, putting in another MVP type season. Uh, Kyrie Irving has taken that next step in terms of being a great number two guy on um, the sideline along, alongside LeBron James. Um, and the Cavs just keep on making number one. All right, and the number one team, Shaw. What more can be said? San Antonio Spurs. Like where all of these teams have suffered significant injuries and clearly it's affected their starting lineups and you know they've gone on and gone in ruts like the Cavs have gone in rut the Golden State Warriors have gone in rut San Antonio Spurs man just continue to keep finding a way to win basketball games they're now only a game out of that number one seed overall in the NBA and the number one seed in the Western Conference eight and two over their last ten games and look I, when we had that conversation show a while back about who you got and you know we were making we were having that convert the discussion about how you know Kawhi Leonard is is on a on a level on his own now and he's really separated himself from the pack and I tried to make the argument that Jilly, Jimmy Butler has kind of pushed himself up there and things of that nature. I, I listen, I'm laying down the gauntlet. I bow down to you, Kawhi Leonard. Kawhi, you know what I'm saying? I mean seriously, Kawhi be killing it. Kilowatt is killing it right now in the NBA. If not the impressive performances by Russell Westbrook and James Harden throughout this year, I mean, there would be no question we'd be talking about uh, Kawhi Leonard as the MVP of the NBA right now. Yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. There was uh, there's an article coming out on uh, 16 with Ring. It's a, it's, a, it's a round table, and they asked a couple people to participate. And the question was asked, you know, to us. I got a chance to, to you know do some writing. It was asked, okay, has the MVP gap, you know, closed, if you will, has it or has it gotten wider at the top? And at the top, to me, it really is like you just said, it's James Harden and Russell Westbrook. So I don't know if that gap has widened at all. I think the gap, and ironically, I'm going to say this, and this might be blasphemous to some, I think the gap between three and four has widened. I think LeBron was probably right there at one point, and I, I still say he's the best player every year, and he's always the MVP, but we know how these things go. I think the gap, though, has widened between three and four. I think Kawhi is clearly the number three guy um, in this race right now for what he's been able to beat and, and do for the San Antonio Spurs team the entire season. 
again, both sides of the basketball, offensively, defensively. He wins games. So shout out to the Spurs and shout out, you know, to Lamarcus Aldridge for, you know, dodging that 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 crazy medical condition with, with his heart. And he's back in the fold, getting them right back in the mix of this conference finals chase without the Golden State Warriors. But, you know, like I said, Lamarcus Aldridge and Kawhi Leonard, a dynamic duo that's going to take the team. And yeah, listen, man, this is going to be a very, very interesting run down the stretch between the Warriors and the San Antonio Spurs. And, you know, if it comes down to a tie, the Spurs hold a tiebreaker, right? So, you know, I, I'm wondering how this is really going to play out. I wonder how this is going to play out in the psyche of the Golden State Warriors. Do they have the moxie, you know, to finish the deal and secure everything that they basically worked hard for? They rolled the dice getting Kevin Durant to put themselves in this position. This is not about them trying to beat the 73 wins from last year. This is about them in, imposing their will as to being the most dominant basketball team this year and to be discussed as one of the most dominant basketball teams in NBA history. That was why they did what they did. And so unless things really come together and it's going to have to happen very, very soon, you're going to have to start wondering, you know, do the Golden State Warriors have what it takes? Because let's keep things in mind. The Warriors, the, even the last two years, Shaw, um, the, 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 the Golden State Warriors have been very fortunate that their road to the NBA Finals has been in, a, in avoidance to the San Antonio Spurs. The last time the San Antonio Spurs played the Golden State Warriors in the playoffs, remember, it was the Spurs that took the Warriors out in six. So my whole, you know, mindset is, is that the Warriors have been fortunate to play against the teams that they match up well against. But when you start playing against a team that knows how to play an offensively gifted-minded team, then it goes back to, are the Warriors good defensively enough to stop a Spurs team that when they start clicking offensively, they're almost as good as any of the teams in the NBA that we talk about with the Houston Rockets and the, and the Warriors and the Cavaliers. I mean, when you got the kind of play that you're getting from Kawhi Leonard, this MVP-like type of skill, that killer instinct goes after it, it's infectious to the rest of the team. And I think it seems to spell well for the Warriors should they have an opportunity to play against the Golden State Warriors at any point during this upcoming NBA playoffs if things do not work in the favor of getting back Kevin Durant and this team figures out what's going, what's going on with them. Well, I didn't want to look that far ahead. I want to see... I don't care whatever kumbaya, ma, kumbaya moment we think we saw in the All-Star game. I want the Warriors to fall to the two seed and for OKC to be that seventh seed. So we can just have that, that carnage uh, of Westbrook and Durant going at each other, you know, assuming Durant is back. Um, just those storylines alone, I, I, I want to see it. And I know Golden State has to wax the floor with OKC the entire, entire regular season, but I'm just, you know, I'm just that dude. You know, I like chaos and I want to see that. But I do think Memphis would be a tougher matchup for them. And, you know, Memphis came back against Golden State earlier in the year and, and, and it traditionally has played them pretty well and given them tough series. So if, if that were to happen and, and Golden State were to fall out of that number one seed, um, that to me is, is the only spot where they're, they're safe in terms of like not having, not having a tough series. Um, I don't think they're going to get beat in the first round, so don't, don't misquote me. But I think in terms of just the mental aspect of, of what it would mean for, for Westbrook and Durant to be going at each other, and the physical aspect, if it's the Grizzlies, of what they do to them. Um, I think Golden State really wants that one seed so they can play Denver, who's inexperienced and has no idea what it even means to be in the playoffs. Um, I, and again, I'm just not really interested in seeing a Spurs, Memphis, Grizzlies matchup in, in the playoffs at all. I just think it's going to be boring. So, you know, <laughs> hey, I'm rooting for carnage and chaos. <laughs> oh, man. Warren, War, Warren Dana White <laughs> holding it down. It. Oh, my God. I love it. Let the madness begin. Let it begin. Forget NCAA tournament. Let's the NBA playoffs madness begin. That's what we're talking about. Awesome show this week, uh, Shaw. You know, Power Five wise, extended definitely, but a lot of good, good content to 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 really kind of uh, chew on. And I think it's really kind of setting the table for what's going to be, you know, again, uh, an interesting three weeks left of basketball to be played. Uh, there's going to be some serious moves that's going to take place when you look at the Eastern Conference and the Western Conference all together. You know, before we were just wondering about who, where is everyone going to bottom out at, but there's still some games to be played and positions to be taken. So it's going to be some serious stuff moving forward. It absolutely is, and it's just going to be great for us to watch and to cover. You know, and we'll talk and we'll get some guests on, and, and we'll go through this thing together and see where thing kind of shakes itself out. But you know, these last 
what is it, 13 to 15 games for some teams. Uh, it's it's going to be a wild ride. And I can't wait to see how the playoff seeding and everything finishes up. You know, I'm sure that we'll have a couple more shutdown candidates as well. Um, my fantasy teams ain't doing too great right now with some of these shutdown candidates. But nevertheless, it's all about what's happening in the real court out there, man. And again, I wouldn't happen to do it with anybody other than you, my brother. So kudos to you, and I, let's keep this thing going. Brother. All right. Well, kudos to you, the listeners. We really appreciate you guys tuning in, checking out the Baseline NBA podcast, and definitely checking out our show, our episode of The Power Five. Cali, Warren Shaw, we appreciate you guys. Be sure to keep us locked in. Download us. Give us ratings. Do all of that good stuff. We're live and direct. We're giving you the NBA as good as it gets, baby. So we'll catch up with you next time.